Coming up next on Good Morning El Paso, medical crews now trying to save the life of a second health care worker infected with Ebola. Why the CDC is now admitting they made a mistake by letting her travel on a commercial flight with a fever. Republicans calling on the Obama administration to impose travel bans from West Africa as many fear an epidemic. Obama tries to keep reassuring Americans. To El Paso, where new developments in the case of Daniel Villegas are developing, will a 20-year-old confession made by Villegas be thrown out? Or will it come back to haunt the defense? Live, where news comes first. From the Mesilla Valley and Las Cruces to El Paso and the borderland. This is ABC 7's Good Morning El Paso. Good morning, everyone. If you are just joining us right now, the two nurses with Ebola are being treated for the deadly virus. One remains in Dallas, the other now in Atlanta. 29 year old Amber Joy Vinson is the second Dallas nurse to catch Ebola after treating Thomas Eric Duncan, the Liberian man who died there last week. What's troubling is that Vinson had just flown on a commercial flight before she knew she had the disease. She actually alerted the CDC, told them she had a fever. But it allowed her to travel anyway, and now the CDC is admitting it did make a mistake. Despite this, the CDC says the risk to the 132 passengers on that plane is extremely low. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Good Morning El Paso. I'm Hillary Florin. Bob Harp is off today. For more complete coverage of the Ebola situation, now we turn to the borderland, where city health officials are preparing now for any possibilities if an Ebola case should make it here to our region. The initial response would be similar to many other infections, isolation, treatment, and investigation of sources. Individuals can take many of the precautions, as you would for cases of the flu, perhaps, hand washing, avoiding the sick, and covering your mouth when coughing. The region's existing systems have already been getting tested, particularly after there was suspicion of Ebola at an Eastside ER over the weekend. Uh, I got a phone call, I think it was 7 o'clock on a Saturday night, and quickly uh, EMS knew about it, the uh, chief of police knew about it, city manager knew about it, uh, CDC was uh, contacted immediately. Uh, so within an hour, uh, everybody who needed to know about it knew about it, and the response was well in place. That patient was ultimately shown not to have Ebola, but Resenda says that the response to the possibility would have been affected had it progressed any further. We're also getting a first-hand look now at the plans to handle an Ebola case over at University Medical Center. To say that everyone is in this country is 100% ready to, to manage it, if someone would walk in the door, I don't think is realistic at this time. I think everyone is still scrambling to obtain the equipment they need to be able to take care of more than one patient that potentially could have Ebola. UMC currently has at least six rooms that could be used to quarantine and treat Ebola patients, but standard equipment could only handle those patients for about five days, and at that point, the hospital would need outside support. Nurse manager Eric Johansson also says UMC is stepping up its training and exercises on using personal protective gear because it doesn't matter what kind of equipment you're wearing if you don't know how to use it. There is always a risk, no matter what level of protection you put on, if you're not paying attention to how you take it off, when you take it off, that is when you make yourself vulnerable for cross-contamination. Some of the specialized equipment UMC needs includes advanced waste systems because nothing, not even a sewage, can leave a room where an Ebola patient is being cared for. Right now at 6.04, Crystal standing by with a look at our forecast on this nice morning. Good morning. Good morning, Hillary. Everyone with us. Happy Thursday. We are almost to your weekend. Conditions still very nice. Cool start to the morning, 55 in El Paso. Winds are at 3 miles per hour. Las Cruces, you're at 49 degrees. A nice chill to the air. Calm conditions outside currently. And as for our clouds and radar map, we keep saying it, just another day of tracking the sunshine. It will be mostly sunny today, but in the days to come, it looks like winds will pick up, clouds will build in, and even chances of rain move into the forecast. We'll talk more about it coming up in just a a few minutes. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Crystal. Meanwhile, testimony is expected to wrap up today in the hearing involving Daniel Villegas. His defense attorneys are looking to have his confession to a deadly drive by shooting in 1993 thrown out. His 1995 conviction was overturned by the Court of Criminal Appeals in December of last year. The state called three former El Paso police detectives to the stand. All of them denied threatening Villegas. Under cross-examination, Earl Arbogast and Carlos Ortega testified they had, quote, made a mistake and changed testimony since taking the stand against Villegas 20 years ago. Former detective Scott Graves testified that he felt harassed by Villegas' supporter, John Mimbella. We'll sometimes tell John that maybe he shouldn't be so aggressive. Yes, I have, uh, but 
John does what he does. Uh, he's very passionate and believes strongly in Daniel's innocence. So, uh, you know, I'll deal with that. The prosecution did not want to comment after the hearing concluded. Court gets back in session at 8.30 this morning and will be there. Former El Paso Mayor John Cook is running against George P. Bush for Texas Land Commissioner. Bush, the nephew of former President George W. Bush, stopped in El Paso yesterday. ABC 7 spoke with Bush in an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview. We asked him whether he has higher aspirations like governor or president. He said it's a possibility, but he's concentrating now on running for land commissioner. The next Bush for president could very well be his dad, Florida Governor Jeb Bush. So we asked him about that, too. Odd. I think that I, along with a lot of other Republicans, think that he could offer so much not only to our party to unify it, but to our country. His opponent, El Pasoan John Cook, has logged more than 30,000 miles campaigning. He realizes beating a Bush is a long shot, but Cook says he's not backing down. Early voting starts Monday. Election Day is November 4th. El Paso State Rep Joe Pickett wants to set the record straight when it comes to a proposed state constitutional amendment on the November ballot. The Democrat held a community meeting last night to talk about Proposition 1. If passed, it would allow revenue generated by the state's oil and gas taxes to be diverted to the state highway fund. Pickett says the money is needed because TxDOT has been relying on borrowed money to pay for highway projects. Pickett says if Proposition 1 fails to pass, the state's economy would immediately take a big hit because construction projects would come to a screeching halt. El Paso Independent School District has appointed a new master principal to oversee administrators at area schools. Probably a familiar face to a lot of you. If you've never heard of the title, though, it's because it's a new position within the district. Here to explain, good morning, El Paso's Denise Olivas. Good morning. Good morning, Hillary. Marielo Morales is now a master principal for EPISD, but before this, she spent 14 years as Coronado High School's principal. Her experience as a leader is what will help administrators, especially those who maybe don't have a lot of experience just yet. Morales says that she will oversee four high schools and its feeder schools. But most importantly, the job title requires her to be a mentor, help principals create new ideas and strategies to improve area schools. Morales won't be letting go of Coronado High School entirely. And I, I am going to, to be able to uh, lead the, the search for the principal at Coronado as well as for Bowie High School. So I will have that privilege. And the other schools that she will oversee include Bowie High School, as she just mentioned, Jefferson El Paso High School and its feeder schools. She says she already sees the challenges in the job, but she's ready to take them all. Hillary, back to you. All right, thanks so much, Denise. And now a live look at traffic. We had some construction closures here earlier in the westbound lanes at I-10 and Airway, but that's open now and things are moving smoothly. If you're getting ready to head out the door, perfect timing. A New Mexico teen could be facing additional DWI charges. This after she was involved in a deadly head-on collision. Police say she killed two people in that crash. What other charges she's looking at and why she could be tried now as an adult. Also, what would happen if a Jet 737 happened to crash at the El Paso International Airport? Would emergency responders be prepared? We'll talk about that coming up. And one thing we are prepared for, the weather. Meteorologist Crystal Kly said she's pretty much only tracking the sun today, right? Yeah, that's right. Another great forecast moving forward, but there are bigger changes on the horizon. We'll look at those coming up after your break. Thanks, Crystal. This is ABC7, where news comes first. We're watching ABC7's Good Morning El Paso with Hillary Florin, Bob Hart, Storm Track Weather Meteorologist Crystal Cly, and live reports from Denise Olivas.